Well, thanks to the organizers for inviting me. I left Canada in 1974 to pursue a career in SFL. I didn't know that I would hardly ever come back. So it's nice to have a chance to, and to come back to this beautiful place where you can get up in the morning and go and run through the totem poles and down through the huge northern rainforest onto the beach, run along the and look at mountains. And come up at lunchtime and for dessert have Nanaimo bars, which are a very cherished thing. And then in the evening, go back down to the beach and have naked people offer you magic mushrooms and beer and all sorts of things. So, I don't know why Jeff is leaving this place. Where is he? I'd be glad to have you back in Sydney, but there's something strange. Okay, so this is not an easy thing for me to connect to. Language change, so I'm a bit of a ween in that respect. The only way I could imagine connecting to it was to talk about metal industry change. And maybe I can have a bit of boost in that regard. So we'll... Um, I've never had such big screens before, and I usually read my screens, so it's strange to be out here. Um, we'll try to talk a little bit about interdisciplinarity, um, what that might mean from a Bernstein SFL point of view, and disciplinarity as well. And then with that as a general background, we'll look, uh, try and think um, what are some of the uh, key fault lines in SFL that would lead to different kinds of registers or languages emerging, uh, what would be some critical forces that might keep them together. And I'll do that with respect to treatment of proto language, all the things we've been talking about, multimodality, treatment of color, and curriculum, and then grammar and meaning. And then I'll end with um, a little bit of deeper consideration of nature and the essay. Okay, first of all, a little bit of introduction to the dialogue that's been ongoing in Australia now for um, about a decade between Bernstein sociologists, uh, in particular, second and third generation Bernstein sociologist. Uh, Carl Mayton is closest to us. I don't know where Jeff is, but thank you for bringing Carl to Australia for the first time so that we could grab him and persuade him to stay. That's been really fantastic. So Carl's model, generally social realism or uh, legitimate code theory. So this is around a dialogue around what um, the Bernstein people refer to as knowledge structure and closest to what we might at first blush consider to be field. So first, the distinction that Bernstein makes between singulars and regions of discourse, because I had planned today to talk about both, but I will only talk about singulars. So a discourse as a singular is a discourse which has appropriated a space to give itself a unique name, for example, physics, chemistry, sociology, psychology, dentistry. These singulars produce a discourse which produced a discourse which was only about themselves. They had few external references other than in terms of themselves created a field of professional knowledge. In the 20th century, particularly in the second half, the very strong classification of singulars has undergone a change. What we now have is a regionalization of knowledge, a recontextualization of singulars, for example, in medicine, architecture, engineering, information science, and education, for example. Any regionalization of knowledge implies a recontextualizing principle, which singulars are to be selected, what knowledge within the singular is to be introduced in the later, regions are the interface between the field of production of knowledge and any field of practice. So this is just to say today we're going to be focusing on singulars and um, linguistics in particular. So we could, in other words, consider what are the possible reasons for sites of kinds of divergence within regions, uh, education for example, but today we'll focus just on SFL. Okay, disciplinarity. Uh, Bernstein, throughout his career, has a concern with the difference between everyday non-school knowledge discourse, communion, and what happens in school and early on refers to that as common sense, uncommon sense. Uh, towards the end of his career, he became uh, much more theoretical about how to think about these things and set up a composition of complementarity if you like, horizontal and vertical discourse. It's easy to find as follows. A horizontal discourse entails a set of strategies which are local, segmentally organized, context-specific, and dependent for maximizing encounters with persons and habitats. This form is a group of well-known features. It is likely to be oral, local, context-dependent and specific, passive, multi-layered and contradictory across the context. A vertical discourse takes the form of a coherent, explicit, and systematically principled structure hierarchically organized in social sciences, or it takes the form of a series of specialized languages with specialized modes of interrogation and specialized criteria for the production of 
zigzagging of text, as in the social sciences. And further within the vertical discourse, the discourse that we leave education for access, uh, he makes a distinction between hierarchical and horizontal knowledge structures. Problematically, in terms of remembering what he's talking about, reusing this term, he has reasons, but uh, maybe not the kind of thing that we appreciate as linguists. Uh, anyway, the difference between hierarchical and horizontal knowledge structure. Hierarchical knowledge structure, a coherent, explicit, and systematically principled structure hierarchically organized, which attempts to create very general propositions and theories, which integrate knowledge at lower levels, and in this way shows underlying uniformities across an expanding range of apparently different phenomena. And he uses the image of a triangle, and the treaty perhaps should be a pyramid for this kind of knowledge. Horizontal knowledge structure, on the other hand, is defined as a series of specialized languages with specialized modes of interrogation and criteria for the construction and circulation of texts such as, for example, the various disciplines of humanities and social sciences and for linguistics. If we were to just take functional approaches, we would have SFL, lexical functional grammar, Roland reference grammar, cognitive linguistics, Leakes functional grammar, and so on, lots of different languages. And he represents these in his capital L for the different languages. Peter Wignall has argued that social sciences are perhaps better characterized as warring triangles since they model themselves in science and fancy themselves to be modeling themselves in science, and then tend to struggle for institutional rather than epistemological ascendancy on the grounds that they never really can subsume in their triangle everything people in the other triangles are trying to do and um, incorporate them into a bigger, better triangle that they control. Uh, rather, they struggle for institutional control over financing, research money, positions, publications, all these things as they come. Compared with the humanities, where technicality and the drive to integration by a general modus and propositions is less strong, that is, they don't fancy themselves in the sciences. Joe Muller proposes verticality to describe how theories progress. This is an interesting I'm not saying there's not difference within vertical knowledge structures, but to describe how they progress by ever more integrative or general propositions related to Bernstein's internal grammar. So what you do is try to make higher order propositions that cover all the data that's been considered before and more. And so uh, build your theory in this term. Or via the introduction of a new language, which constructs a fresh perspective, a new set of questions, a new set of connections, and apparently new problematic, and most important, a new set of speakers. So here's the generational flavor of the new ideas coming up against the old. And then Bernstein propo Muller proposes grammaticality to describe how theoretical statements yield empirical predicates. Bernstein strongly the external kind. The stronger the external grammaticality of a language, the more stably it is to generate empirical correlates, and the more unambiguous because the more restricted its field of references. Reference. So thus in a hierarchical knowledge structure, we set up hypotheses and test them against data, whereas at the other end of the spectrum, as you design a new language in the humanities, you use it to reinterpret a text. You reread Shakespeare, queer, feminist, Marxist, whatever kind of perspective. So if we wanted to arrange these ideas together uh, in terms of work we've been trying to do in linguistics, in terms of grammatical metaphor, technicality, appraisal, genres, and so on, how these things map, uh, you get a picture that Giovanni uh, will recognize, perhaps, as looking very similar to what he came up with when he was talking to us the other day. Uh, quite an interesting picture when he explored these kinds of dimensions in terms of the kinds of images that were used. Uh, in fact, I think what he was doing was confirming a division that Bernstein makes. It's Bernstein's hierarchical knowledge structure, horizontal knowledge structure division here. I've done it as a kind of spectrum, but in fact, it was quite a sharp fall off in terms of the kind of imaging on the right-hand side of this line here, uh, as opposed to what goes on over there. Well, it's a very interesting site for negotiation in terms of a corpus approach to images. Of course, we want to reconsider it with respect to all kinds of other patterns as well. But maybe we're um, much more like humanities than we aspire to be, or I think we are. Whenever I'm at a student information day talking to parents of students, you always say, oh, 
what's linguistic science of language, right? The tendency of horizontal knowledge structures to progress by the introduction of a new language focuses our attention on the centripetal potential of such disciplines. How is it that we get more and more triangles? How is it that we get more and more languages? And what are the fault lines around which the new languages emerge? Until we have different languages, new sets of speakers, new kinds of connections. Maybe through a stage where we have different registers of a particular approach, to the stage where we say, well, people don't really understand each other, they can't talk to each other, they don't hear different languages, they can't reach different goals. And we'll explore one such source of divergence in SFL around the issue of access and stratification. We'll set aside a very interesting question of what would happen in regions where you have singulars being recontextualized. You might have, in terms of grammar based literary, literacy pedagogy, triangles, parts of triangles being recontextualized into the pedagogy, parts of humanities languages as well. A whole different issue of how different approaches to education uh, diverge. But today we'll just focus on the question of singular. Okay, so we'll explore the access stratification problem issue, fault line, if you like, with respect to coded language, and with respect to multimodality, in particular ambience and family. Okay, so just to set this up, I'll make a distinction between hierarchy and complementarity. I'm going to do one of each today. SFL is an assemblage of hierarchies and complementarities. Hierarchies are things like stratification, instantiation, individuation. We will see the stratification today. So there it's set up. The M sub vocabulary on the right and our tradition, tradition, my traditional vocabulary. And complementarity, I'll illustrate with respect to axis. Okay, so the uh, complementarity of system and structure. Uh, illustrated here just with a little fragment of English mood. Do we look at English mood from the perspective of structure, in terms of what functional elements, like what subject is finite, their presence, their absence, their sequence, how that patterns in the language? How do we relate that to a paradigmatic perspective on the same thing in terms of familiar oppositions like individual comparative, clarity, and prerogative? The important thing about a complementarity is you're looking at the same thing from two points of view. The system and structure are looking at the same thing from two points of view. Even though in SFL we're going to privilege the paradigmatic perspective over the syntagmatic one, um, it's um, still a question of how we interlock the two and how we use argumentation from structure to motivate as criteria for systems and how from the systems we then generate the structures. The question of how these things are tied together is absolutely critical. There would be an example of a similar fragment of mood from Tagalog with some very different realizations where the difference between indicative and imperative is shown morphologically in terms of whether we use finite or non-finite non -finite morphology for the verb. And as was discussed in previous sessions this afternoon, you show the difference between Declarative and interrogative with a particle, clitic particle that, um, well, typically after the most negotiable part of the language is formed. I suppose that looks reasonably harmless, but if I were to say on the basis of this, this kind of axial argumentation that Tagalog doesn't have a subject of finite, you wouldn't be surprised with Philippinus, because Philippinus argued about this, we argued about this for decades and decades. I said, like most languages, Tagalog doesn't have a subject of finite, then you would react in a quite different way. Because most of you believe in the subject, because you've inherited it from Latin, or you borrowed it from IMG. It's very hard in terms of the axial argumentation and get people to give up subject of finite 
as resources for instructionary flaws in terms of diversity and inclusion. So, keeping this notion of this one hierarchy stratification and this complementary system structure in mind, we'll now turn to our three agendas for today, uh, beginning with photo language in the realm of genesis of how we model diverse system of meaning symbiosis of parent and child and the interaction that they give each other with each other. So the question here is, do we model the proto language as comprised of one stratum or two? So there's the well-known microfinchial account of the proto language from Halliday. And here is a rendering of the painter And we see in terms of structure here, a uh, mixture of intonational, segmental, and prosodic phonology probably would be better, and spatial gestural uh, structural realizations of the choices. And then they're organized in terms of microfunctional systems here. So we have a set of um, microfunctional meanings, systems with their structural realizations. Uh, later, Painter rereads some of these microfunctions from the point of view of the phrasal theory, uh, a different perspective on what the meanings are that are involved here. Uh, so there's that system reread. If you know the phrasal method, you'll see the various attitudinal features highlighted now, uh, looking at the proto language not in terms of microfunctions, but in terms of the affectival charge of the uh, meanings of the interaction. Again, one system structure cycle around the realizations. Painter's rereading of microfunctions and semiotic system of affect shows that the structural realizations of the proto language underdetermine the sustained interpretation. And that's the best we can do, I think, at this stage of language development. Later on, when we're dealing with mature languages, of course, we're hoping that the perspective that we're taking on structure is going to axially charge the sustained interpretation, that those two things are going to mutually inform each other so that we can argue from one to the other. So that is some comments on this as, well, as follows. Content expression organization of proto-language is thus simultaneously stratal and axial. Which amounts to saying it's simultaneously a hierarchy and a complementarity or maybe say we can see it neither way. The dimensions of stratification and axis are not independently variable at this stage. The content stratum is organized paradigmatically, while the expression stratum is an inventory of indivisible postural or gestural systems. If we do this in terms of our co-tangential circles for representing stratification hierarchy, then what we're saying is that it's a system of way he goes on and phrases what's going on. So instead of two system strike structure cycles, one for each stratum, as illustrated here. We have one system structure cycle, but spread across two strata. Alternatively, one system structure cycle constituting one strain. So these are the choices we have in modeling the proto language when we have axis and strata, in some sense, coextending with one another. So model is two strata, neither with axis, essentially, or one strata. With axis. And I think the choices we make here have a lot of implications for how we talk about ontogenetic complexity as it evolves. As it evolves. We assume content expression there from the start and talk about the emergence of complexity with that as a given, or do we talk about emergent complexity as 
moving from a single strain into a multi-strain resistor. And relates to some things I was probing yesterday about how we understand the social in relation to the semiotic. If we want to tear that up in terms of evolution. Tangential to circular magic terms. This is what we're looking at, or this is what we're expecting. Looking back to mature adult language, we model the proto language like that. Mrs. Stevens is interested in Genesis. She would we be proposing a major component of our cartography, a rank, a metafunction, or a straight in the absence of a distinctive system of evidence. It's quite important to reach consensus on that. We don't have consensus to declare our reading position. A lot more often than to think. So let's turn to another area now, uh, multimodal area, looking at uh, analysis of images, and we'll be working on uh, data from a project that Len Ensworth, Claire Painter, and I were working on for some years that Claire is running up now, and we're working on around the ambient ambience. So we're looking at children's picture books and trying to build resources for teachers to think about working with the picture books with students. So do we model a given semiotic system other than language as it applies to one strain or two? So there's the ambience network that we worked out. Uh, it's a register-specific network for children's picture books. If you like, it's a simplification of all of the different color systems noted in Professor and Len Rubin's reading images, the ones that we thought were relevant to this register. And we also had an eye on the applications that could be made of our work. And so there's the pressure of needing to simplify things to make them workable in that context. Grayscale systems were at the beginning, cutting off the black and white. So it's just a general question of whether we have an outline drawing or we have um, something with lighting effects In other words, are the color resources the kind that would be used to account for drawings of this kind? And I think the original version of um, Kipling's How the Camel Got His Hump. Or dealing with other images in grayscale. And being able to talk about what it is to have something that's predominantly grayscale splash of color. We'll talk about that in terms of textual systems I won't introduce. Color systems um, don't come through very well once you go through the solid PowerPoints, okay? but um, this is the idea. It's a general set of systems choices here having to do with vibrancy. So we have the vibrant full saturation characteristic of traditional children's picture books. Or are those systems muted in some respect with respect to both the amount of light, dark white, and the amount of color? Uh, so we have lighter, muted shades, and darker shades. I'm trying to show you a vibrant, light, dark red. Not very well. Then, question of warm and cool colors the warm, red, orange, yellow, brighter hue, blue. Northern rainforest colors. And then finally, the question of differentiation. We have a more familiar kind of color spectrum that we live with here, most of our walks of life with lots of different colors around us. Or do we go for more kind of monochrome in the pictures, which has the effect of giving some kind of othering, green, remoteness in the past and other place. The ambient system structure cycle affords readings of the vibrant, warm, familiar tone of canonical picture books for young children. A 
and paired with the doctor to give her a more removed mood and conflict of his sub stories in relation to previous Australian dreaming. Uh, David Rose and I were working on the way in which um, Kipling's just so genre is used to bastardize Australian dreaming culture. So it doesn't do justice actually to the vibrancy of this out of words got their colors from one series of these supposed dreamy stories which are then told as just so stories. And there's another series which actually is much better informed by the dreaming but still uses the just so story genre up to a point. Uses the natural ochre colors of indigenous uh, imagery, image work in Australia. So that kind of content. So we wanted a network that we could use to describe the ambience, or to describe it, as we're calling it, of color choices that are made. Traditional children's picture book rendering of just those stories and one that's comprised but has more ambitious identity construction. And the cycle can be used to explore color in relation to present and women's technological, sensory, abstract, and metaphysical conscious voting orientations of modern day life. made any progress developing a stratified account of illustrations in children's picture books, which distinctive system structure cycles on two levels of abstraction, primary form and expression form, whatever mother function we work with. Axis and straighter do not appear to be independently varied. Clearly register an identity condition realization, so it is something more than what I showed you. But this can be handled along the hierarchies of instantiation and individuation does not bear on the issue of stratification. In other words, do we have distinct systems of valeur at different levels of abstraction, one realizing the other? So as you write the book, <laughs> this is what we're going to be proposing, a single straight of account of images in the children's picture books with a full system structure cycle for each mother function. makes meaning. It's a semiotic system. One straight semiotic system that makes meaning. As we could consider proto-language to be. Raises the general question whether all imagined systems or nonverbal semiotic systems can be represented in this way. So far I think the evidence will point to yes they can. Nobody's convincing, fully stratified system structure cycles for any of the nonverbal semiotics, as far as I know. As systemic functional semioticians working on modalities other than, like, other than language, should we be proposing a major component of our multimodal cartography, rank, a mother function, or strata, in the absence of a distinct system of our room? Systemesis. And the third area of application, grammar meaning. Part of grammar and should be grammar, let's say. What if that is calling the Sydney School the Sydney School? That's bad. Your turn to suffer. Okay, so far we've been considering the problem of one stratum or two when axis conflates with stratum. And do we model it as two strata, neither with axis or one strata with axis? Turn our gaze now to the problem of two strata or three, the issue of stratified content.
In other words, we have two system structure cycles, one for lexicodynamics and one for discourse semantics. Or one system structure cycle. One referred to, let's say, as semantics, the other class form and structure. I think that's just a dialectic. Shifting our gaze up one stratum boundary to essentially the same pitch. Okay, this is of course the familiar divergence of Sydney and Cardiff approach to grammar and meaning. And we'll review it briefly here in relation to the person meaning, mood, and modality for the five topics that before I gave us some review. The first mood. Mini grammar fragment of English where these major parameters from which the whole shape of the mood map is going to flow are based on these kinds of structural generalizations. Now you can begin to elaborate a little bit and fine tune in relation to different kinds of questions. The basic idea is that we do have a complementarity and the structures are motivating the systems and the systems are realized by the structures and that there is axial argumentation involved in setting things up and then having to shape by generalization of the structural realization of the kind that are being specified here. Compared to Cardiff grammar, one version of these ethics, the most recent that I could find, where if we consider the comparable structural features of subject and finite operating conditions, note a number of things. First of all, subject, finite, finite subject, all up and down the list of realizations, there is more options given and these are previous questions. These are only information systems, so we might how do you read particular books? The other connection. Again, you'll see quite a range of different kinds of structure realization. It seems to appear to me that the network is in any way motivated by making generalizations about the structure realizations. It's motivated in other terms. Function structure that's actually the criterial for Sydney grammars presence, absence, subject, finite, and or sequence is not actually the criteria for the kind of The reason for this, of course, is the large inventory of mood options included in the kind of system. includes both direct and indirect speech acts, mood metaphors, if you like. So, alongside, give me a walnut bun, you have options for, could you give me a walnut bun, why don't you give me a walnut bun? But not all indirect proposals are there. I don't understand myself why some mood metaphors are included and not others. Does that have to do with um, what goes on in a grammarian's mind when they're thinking of examples? I don't know. I'm pretty focused on this where it happens. 
So here's a dear friend of ours in Manly at his um, favorite bake shop, and um, trying to get his favorite one, I think. I can't remember exactly what. He says, I wonder if I could have one of those to serve as his body when he was so dead drunk. Christian, of course. Trying to use his Swedish voting orientation in an Australian service encounter. I guess that's why he was thinner in Sydney. The Cardiff Grammar includes just one indirect proposition, if you like mood metaphor propositions. But there are lots of them. If I want to find out what your name is, I could ask you, what's your name? I could put that as canonical, or I could say, who you are, according to Thomas. I could say, tell me your name, imperative. I could say, I'm Robert or Michael. And these lead to comparable instances of misunderstanding, where humorous effect appears when the play Educating Rita, when the working class woman arrives for the first meeting with her alcoholic literature teaching tutor uh, at the university, not knowing the genre, and the tutor proceeds at a certain point to say, and you are, and Rita says, I'm a what? And Frank says, pardon, this is what? And you are? What is your name? He says, enunciating like she's a Idiot. Uh, your first name? Well, that would at least constitute some sort of start, wouldn't it? Rita. Rita. Beautiful play about education. Of class. <laughs> this raises the question of the extent to which mapping axis on strata tends to weaken the mutual determination of system and structure, and thus the potential for argumentation of the mapping criteria motivating features and systems. The loss of structural generalization seems to favor this mapping probably thus weakening the increment of matter in the verticality of matters. The alternative approach is stratification of mood and speech function. So you have your mood systems attempting to capture the structural generalizations in a mutually determined axial system structure cycle in the grammar, and also semantic networks between them, allowing for the grammatical metaphor. So, congruent realizations of state, or giving information if you want features, and so on, as opposed to some of the indirect possibilities. I haven't tried to be exhaustive there, and I don't think we can be exhaustive about the grammatical metaphor, because the grammatical metaphors in a language aren't an inventory, like the resources in a grammar play there in terms of the kind of tension that we introduce between the grammar and semantics if we go to a stratified model with two system networks and a developed construction. So directly related to the axis stratification issue is the question of how we model direct and indirect speech acts or interpersonal metaphors of mood as involving grammatical metaphor or not. And so, if so, to make sure I won't get through today, I'll have to back off. Whether we want to model that as involving stratal tension, the grammar making one kind of meaning and the semantics another, or a semantic junction, my less preferred model of keeping the two together in the semantics. If we prefer stratal tension to capture the literal transferred duality according to the kind of verbal play and misunderstanding just reviewed, two system structure cycles and different levels of abstraction are required Okay. The question here is what we understand by metaphor. And we understand grammatical metaphor as two meanings in a figure ground relationship, one symbolizing the other. That's, is that our conception of what's going on and why? And how we use that kind of conception to interpret the verbal play and misunderstanding. We need some kind of model where there's two meanings there. We can't afford a model. to modality. IFG style, where would modality end up in terms of the actual argumentation in IFG style grammar? It's um, dependent on indicative. But it's going to be realized by modal verbs or modal adverbs, and they're not possible in comparatives. This is absolutely critical 
and you see the way in which things spin out of control into complete misunderstandings very quickly if we're not very careful here. Now, of course, if our opposition options for proposals down here include finite clauses, then we can put modalities down there as well. I argue that modality doesn't belong here, but actually plus classifies interpretive imperative. But if imperative is constrained axially in the way it is in IFT, and indicative is constrained axially in those terms, then modality is dependent on indicative. And then this goes, for example, to the question of how many metafunctions we have in the language. If we want to argue there's three, personal, mediational, textual, then the way in which we argue about how system structures go together is absolutely critical to the question of how many metafunctions we have, because here we're showing how mood and modality are related to one another as modality is dependent on mood, but if we don't have that kind of axial argumentation used in IFT, then we get a completely different picture. This would be an example of what I mean about mutual uh, unintelligibility. I don't hear in the arguments about how many metafunctions there are in language people going straight to the question of axial argumentation, how we deal with stratification and axis, which is what we're talking about. People argue about something completely different. So there's complete misunderstanding. Okay, now here we run into comparable problems with direct and indirect realizations. I'll just focus on one of the modality metaphors here. Uh, so we'll probably sing the song, or I, I think I suppose we'll sing the song. So this issue of whether we have a subjective and explicit modality. So something that's literally a clause complex. I reckon we'll sing it, won't we? Tag shows making some sense. This is the proposition we're negotiating. So there is a mood network, which I know you can't read. Tucked away in the corner here is our modality interpretation, which um, in fact includes um, the grammatical metaphors, the modality metaphors. So the subjective, objective, and explicit implicit options are included in the mood network. And explicit subjective is the one that gives you, I think I reckon I suppose, you think I reckon I suppose. manifestation system is there in a place I wouldn't have expected it. Whoops. So the IFT3 grammar covers both direct and indirect modalizations. So both the implicit subjective role of the grammar in the rights of the song and the explicit subjective. I suspect it's the same. Setting aside the problem of how can it be that a clause complex is realizing a clause, a clause complex is not a kind of clause, let's put that problem on hold for a minute. We have the now familiar problem of straddle tension to deal with according to the play. So I'll give you another example this time, humorous effect, a joke told on modality metaphor. So for those of you who are North Americans, this is set in terms of rugby rather than gridiron football. Rugby, anyway. And it's a great rivalry between Australia and New Zealand in rugby, and it's one of the things the New Zealanders can usually beat Australia at. Uh, and this little piece from the newspaper goes as follows and Laughter can be the best medicine. This was followed by Tapoti Tapoti from Ruby Pohes, I can't say this, and the phone message. Hey, bro, heard the one about a lie detector being installed on the Wallabies bus. Wallabies are the Australian rugby. A center most medium-sized players, hooked himself up and said, I think we have the best defense in the world. The detector went off. A front rower then hooked himself up and said, I think I'm the best player in the world. The detector went off. The second rower said, I think, and the detector went off. Goodbye. I hope none of you are second rowers. I don't think so. Once again, the grammatical metaphor creates problems for an account of grammar and meaning involving one system structure cycle. Whether we situate the account of indirect re realizations in an IFG three style lexical grammar or a Carter style one axis semantics. So 
got a problem here. You've got two meanings in a figure ground relationship. You can't model that in one straight in. So if you do, you have to have some other way of talking about how there's the two meanings there that enable this kind. I mean, alternatively, we could set up a stratified kind of modality. We could deal with topological semantics. If you have to do a typological one, it could be a useful way of complementing what goes on in the grammar around certain kinds of grammatical argumentation. Particularly the grammatical argumentation here that sets the mid values modalities, mid values modalities against the high low ones for good grammatical reasons. If you want to do it more at the scale, you have the option of stratifying, setting up a couple of system structures like this, allowing for the figure ground relationships, allowing for the modality metaphors in terms of straight attention. Good, I'm going really fast. Okay, good. Good time to be going really fast at the end of the conference. Okay, we'll just push this a little deeper and um, try and think a little more what lies beyond this. And I'll give you my idiosyncratic reading of the history of linguistics. I believe in them. I don't think anybody else does. Okay, so sir. So, my reading of Saussure. So he is saying, well, what is the nature of sign? It's a bonding of synergy of signal. So the sign is the bonding, and he struggled, it seems to me, in his writing, or his students struggled in their account of what he was teaching them, to say that the sign is the bonding of the signature itself. And for me, that means that other than teaching this to students, you, you should never mention the word synergy or synergy on again. Gone. Their signs fused. Different from common sense, where we have signs standing for concepts. I suppose the EPI cotangential circuit we treat is something like that. So common sense tells us that a sign stands for a concept. But you would say, no, the sign is the binding of the synergy of signature. It's not standing for something, it is the binding of it. And then he moves on and talks about valeur, systems of valeur. The meaning of signs then is difference. The interrelationship of the signs to one another is what gives meaning to the system. Yamsam comes along and says, okay, yeah, right. But binding relationship is complicated. The binding relationship between the, that bonds synergy synergy on is a stratified one. Involving content form and expression form. And there's substance. We don't have to worry about that as any additions. We work on this term. My reading, Hemsev argues that semiosis, including linguistic, is about the network of relationships bonding synergy and signal. So linguistics, semiotics are about this fine thing. And I'm always trying to say to my students, we live here. We live here. We're interpreting that binding relationship. We're not biologists or neurobiologists about the physical and biological resources that manifest these things. We're not philosophers or cognitive psychologists trying to build a theory of meaning as if language didn't make the meaning. We're neither of those. We're semi-editions, we're linguists. We live here. We study immateriality, as Fisher put it. That's what we study. I read Kemsa as commenting on the nature of the bonding of synergy and synergy on. It's a stratified system. 
understand that language and understand their ecosystems and networks of relationships. Not a big lamb would say, all the rest. We have come a reading whereby Templer is taken as proposing a rehabilitation of Sinipi and Sinipion. As if, okay, now we can get Sinipion back as the expression form, we get Sinipi back as content. Maybe helpful to think of some of Chris Cleary's ideas in this regard. He has lots of theorizing about the nature of hierarchies and different kinds of relationships between things, building a model of emergent complexity of life, universe, and everything. But he's been writing for many years, and I guess we'll write for many years more before any of us ever see it above it. Anyway, he refers to the kind of hierarchy I've been talking about today as a supervenience hierarchy. Pattern of patterns, meta redundancy, and J Lampy's terms. And contrast that with what it is to say that one system is embedded within another. Uh, for example, a semiotic system embedded in a biological system, embedded in physical systems. So, in Chris's terms, he would say that what Nemslev is doing is proposing supervenience as a way of thinking about the bonding of senior faces. And then we want to have some substance as what that's embedded in. Which I'm happy living with these gems of terms, but let's say embedded in biological, embedded in physical materiality. Immateriality embedded in biological. So one very deep fault line runs as follows. Does a semiotic system by definition involve at least two strata? Is that our starting point? Not the form of expression. Or is stratification a process of emergent complexity involving two distinct systems of allure? For example, a bistratal system evolving out of the monostratal one, or a tristratal system evolving out of the bistratal one. Further, if they both are complex. Note that answering yes to one encourages the conflation of axis and strata to co language and many non-dual semiotics and provides a model for conflating axis with strata elsewhere that Templer has not as examined as a part of the model. So, this gives us a number of issues for arbitration to worry about the nature of semiosis. Clear what our position is, the amounts to what we believe in, what's the nature of our axial argumentation, if any, what do we count as criterial phenomena, for example, dramatic metaphor when worrying about stratification, what do we do about questions of identity, sets of speakers, in relation to these ideas. How does all this relate to appliability? What we can do with our models? The sort of issues of complexity that were raised. We speak to people outside. And I think in terms of complexity, in terms of how we understand the world. Ultimately, what is important is to recognize the fault lines through which new languages emerge. When do we evolve a new register? Cartography is tweaked, not all of it being used, tweaked in such a way as to be useful for different tasks. And when do we get to the point where the fault lines are not so deep that we have mutually unintelligible discourses? When does a new language emerge? What are the consequences for our community? Around what points of divergence might we stop being a community? What are the counterbalancing centripetal forces that bind us together? 
some sense of triangularity, verticality, grammaticality. We do fancy ourselves to be scientists, so we do try to resolve issues, evolve rather than fragment. And regionality in Bernstein's sense, to what extent might our applications hold us together as a kind of force of metastability because the ideas are out doing something important for us in the world, we can't mess with them. However much we want to kick ass in our theory, we don't really want to mess with what's out there already at work. Well, in preference to today's source of divergence in SFL, I have some suggestions. You know what I'm going to say. As the famous is concerned with Genesis, Logo, Milo, should we be proposing a major component of our cartography as angle, that a function of straight angle, in the absence of a distinctive axially moving system of Bovera? As systemic functional semioticians working on modalities other than language, should we be proposing a major component of our multimodal cartography of angle, that a function of straight angle, in the absence of a distinctive axially motivated system? As systemic functional linguists working on grammar and meaning content form, should we be proposing a major component of our cartography? Okay, Yatnik lives in Hong Kong for the next six months. I think we're kind of happy. Thank you. <laughs>